So, um, first of all, who saw the additional um, lecture from the BBC that uh, went on the website, video le lecture? So we couldn't get the BBC in this time because the uh, two years we did some work um, on some AVX projects, but we've got Lush's um, NL and the BBC uh, lecture about how the UX is done in the BBC. It's not examinable per se, but it's interesting and it might be useful, especially if you want to apply to the BBC, BBC for UX jobs. In fact, there'll be UX jobs coming up at the BBC in the next month. Uh, it's part of their graduate training, so it's always a possibility to uh, fancy doing some new acts work and some new specialist work. It's always a possibility to give them a, uh, uh, to apply. It's on their, we have their BBC Jobs website. Um, everybody should realise that the, um, the, the notes for each of these uh, um, lectures are already on the website, so they've been on the website since we started, and also the slides, they're all on slide share um, the day before the lectures, so you can always get them down, they're always tweeted. Okay, so some people can say, oh, we've not got the slides, well, they're there in the day in advance. Um, so you should be able to get them. Um, next week, um, as you probably, well, I don't know if you know, but anyway, next week, um, you're going, there's going to be a 30 minute, no, no, a one hour um, session that I'm going to um, host here, from 10 till 11, and then we'll break for coffee as normal, and then there'll be ThoughtWorks who are going to come in, a couple of guys from ThoughtWorks who will come in and tell you how they do uh, user experience, okay? So if you're interested in UX and you also want to talk to them about careers in UX with ThoughtWorks, then you may be able to think about chatting to them after. So they should finish at about quarter to 11, quarter to 12, sorry, so there'll be some time if people want to discuss career opportunities with them. Um, we should also be getting in a few weeks after that um, Barclays, because they do, they've got quite a big user experience division in um, <coughs> Manchester, okay? um, or in the Northwest anyway. So Barclays will be coming in to do um, a lecture on how they do user experience in the banking and finance industries. Okay, so um, those are the ones we've got on the programme at the moment. Um, the um, Guardian can't. Well, we haven't got dates for the Guardian, unfortunately, because they just can't get the time to come up here in the dates that we've got. If I'm able to, um, if I'm able to get them up after Easter, then I might put, you know, ask them to come up and then we'll just so instead of one of the revision sessions, we'll have um, some time with uh, the Guardian. But we still want to get back to us. Okay, so um, also, who of you have started doing coursework two yet? A few, okay, so remember there should be more of you doing coursework two if you want to get it out, bat it out of the way. Um, so it's up there, you can get the links, the links are all up there on the website. There's some additional information on what I'm expecting uh, from you, so some clarification on uh, what I'm expecting from you, so that's all up there too. Okay. okay. Um, so let's get started. So generally, we've already finished now the kind of design aspect. So how do we elicit information, how do we design um, uh, interfaces in the context of how do we move that, the, the requirements to software engineers or designers, developers, that kind of thing. Okay? So we've already done this. Um, we're on, on to now the sort of building part. And the idea of these next uh, four lectures actually, not four lectures, three to four weeks, is to show you um, how really you ought to be thinking about build the building process. Okay? So what kind of things should you be thinking about as you're building, um, and what kind of, and why, what's the rationale for you thinking this stuff? Yeah? Okay, so, first pop quiz, uh, how do you go about getting the what in the user experience, i.e. the stuff we've already done. So if we, um, Let's say, if we had six months, yes? <coughs> you immerse yourself in the company and specifically the role you're trying to work out Okay, so you immerse yourself in the company and role and see, try to work out exactly what they want. Organization. Okay. Conversations that, you know, with people who are using the system. 
Analysis, yeah, and review test analysis, that sort of a um, bit longer than participant <coughs> observation, so test analysis is good. What's the problem with test analysis? <coughs> Not a bit of an idea because a lot of times um, you already have to know the tasks, so you're already not allowing people, you're not observing people to understand <coughs> what. You know, what they're doing, they're saying there's a preset, there's already presets, a pre-definition of the tasks that you're thinking people might be doing when you're looking for those tasks to analyze those tasks. So you might miss one if you're not looking for it. Like that. Anything else? Okay, so um, might you do interviews with people, individuals? Might you do a survey or a questionnaire maybe? That kind of thing? Um, why post it's important? Easy to change. Easy to change, so they're flexible, that's good. Any others? Yeah? They're physical, so you can move them around and group them together and things like that. They're physical, so that you can move them around and group them together, so that's good. Yeah, uh, the disposable users don't mind. Like, yeah, that's the main thing as well. They're disposable, so users don't mind trashing them. They don't mind, they don't think that you as a designer or as a UX uh, specialist have put a lot of time into it, that they might think from a more polished prototype, okay? So they're happy for, to, to say, oh, I don't agree, and just trash them, okay? <coughs> um, so, there are some, some formal and informal methods of moving information through the pipeline from <coughs> collecting information to giving it, getting it into a format that maybe developers and users can understand. <coughs> We've got um, informal and uh, semi-formal. What might the semi-formal one be? Okay. Okay. Conversation with the purpose. So the conversation with the purpose semi-formal formal, and also you might think of coding in the context of ethnographers formal, because we get into analysis on that. But also, formal, semi-formal might be things like uh, flowcharts, okay? So that's bordering on the more formal of semi-formal. I mean, you could also say that more formal would be um, users uh, in your mouth. In which case, what would be informal? So for, for informal uh, ones of these, you might think of personas, scenarios, user stories, news cases. There's plenty to be thinking about. Um, ooh, what are the 
two main danger points to remember when undertaking user experience design. So we use a variety of methods. What might we call that use? Hybrid or triangulation? Yeah? We've probably got quite a small group of people we ask these questions, so we have bias. Yeah. So it's a very small group of people, so we could have a big uh, we could have quite a big bias towards one one desirable um, as opposed to a more general uh, department. Yeah. We also have our own bias that we <coughs> Yes, so we also have our own biases and expressions that we might put into it. Some of that you could say is a good bias because it might be experience based in this sort of we know more, we can direct more, but also it might be a bad bias because you never really know whether you know um, you're missing something if you just kind of skip statements. Um, yeah. Can you approach it and be uh, like too formally as you're confident that you understand all this up to yet. Have you all been reading the notes as I suggest you do at the end of every lecture? Yeah? I hope you have, because there's a lot there and it's probably not a good idea to just try and do it all in one note. Okay? Okay, so, ooh, effective experience. This is what we're going to be looking at today. So, effective experience. What do we mean by effective experience? Anybody? Got any ideas? It's kind of easily understood words. Experience we kind of understand? Effective. Not without looking at the slides, not without going forwards in the slide share if you possibly can. Effective experience. What do we mean by that? Accomplishing the task. Pardon? Accomplishing the task. Accomplishing the task, okay? <coughs> Same thing, okay? Any more? So, a powerful effect, producing a notable effect, effectual, okay, this is what the uh, Oxford English Dictionary um, uh, uh, defines it as. And I would also say that effective experience is exactly this, accomplishing the task in a, in a, in an effective, in a, in, 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 by producing a powerful effect. Um, the thing about accomplishing the task is that it might not be um, efficient, it might be annoying, it might not be good, it might be just... It's just a matter of being able to do it, okay, to get an effect. And so I'm using this term with, for a term that others would describe as accessibility. So who's, who's heard of accessibility? A few people, yes, a few people. So who wants to tell me what they think accessibility actually is about? We've heard the term that we don't want to start. Okay, so in accessibility we don't call it limitations, we call it designing the systems with the user in mind, you know, with their specific set of needs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Designing a system that behaves the way the user thinks it should behave, so instead of having people that are joined. Yeah, so designing a system the way that the user thinks it's all behaving. So actually, um, as we get further on, you might hear a term called cognetics. Have you heard of cognetics? Okay, so it's a term that was uh, made famous, more famous by Jeff Raskin, and that talks about um, designing systems so that it fits our cognitive, um, our cognitive processes as opposed to the other way around, that we have to fit to the system. But anyway, it, with accessibility, this is what I'm talking about right now. So accessibility has been in the past, the only thought of was being about disability. Okay? 
Okay? So you might have um, instances where we're looking at trying to create technology which is usable by people with um, a physical disability or a visual disability. In fact, any of the disabilities that we see, any of the any impairments that may impair the sensory input that we talked about in the, in the what, second week, okay? When we're looking for the different um, ways to get information in. So that's uh, uh, vision, uh, hearing. Okay. Physical movement of input, that kind of thing. So that's what we're looking at. That's what we mainly see in also cognitive disability. So you could just think of what you're doing as being only about accessibility. So therefore, a lot of companies tend to think that this is as important as making the thing look nice. Okay, making the making their applications look um, uh, sort of uh, um, efficient. <coughs> okay, but actually. It actually is, and I want to show you in this part why this first bit, why it's um, useful to think of accessibility as really about effective use as opposed to just about disability, and also about um, what then what you should be thinking about as you're trying to design, okay, as trying to build. So, um, so Tatu's connotations were about a disability, and the reason why I don't hold with this is that I think it's much broader than disability. And, in reality, I have my opinion because it's my specialist area, and so I can have what people are like. Um, you guys might need to have your own opinion about this. So I think it's about the ability to produce an effect, um, regardless of how the ability does or does not exist. So that's what we're trying to do, is this ability to produce an effect. So you need to make sure that you aren't making assumptions about what ability people have to produce that effect. Okay. So, Here's one. Um, access for everybody. So while paddling a Boris bike, I start to shuffle in my pocket. Where is the damn iPhone? Finally, I get it. The next challenge is to get it out, uh, my pocket, get out of my pocket while still navigating the Humvee of the bike world. Okay, so that's obviously a Boris bike. If everybody, anybody's ever seen a Boris bike, they're a nightmare. You know, they're huge, horrible things that are really, really terrible to you. Anyway, eventually I give up, I pull over, get my iPhone out, look at the nearest docking station with spaces and get back on my way. So, the way, so that is one problem of access, and this in the accessibility world is called situational impairment. Okay, you are impaired by the situation of use or the thing that you are using. Okay, and that's for everybody. It's the technology that's the impairment, um, i.e., this iPhone. So generally, what's designed, although obviously there's an error on here, so just figure A, but the, what's designed is this little. Um, uh, little link that you wear, um, and it's built using um, uh, Android technology, okay? And so this little link on your, uh, which is just a wristwatch, tells you um, where the bikes are, and where the nearest bikes are, and where the nearest spots, where the slots for bikes are. So we can see here that we've got uh, Wellington Road, there's 17 slots and no bikes, 14 slots and two bikes, okay? So, Obviously, this is the best one to go to because it's got its nearest and it's still got 17 spots available when you want to park your bike up. Okay. Also, you can still, you know, if you want to actually get bikes, then maybe um, the second one down is probably the best. Okay. But it means that you're not hindered. You can still be on your voice bike. You can just look, yeah, this is where I'm going to be next. Okay. So it's not just about the design of this technology. You can think, oh, we're going to do something whereby we put everything on the iPad and the iPad and we assume that people will just stop the bike, you know, take out their iPad and their iPhone, try and then log in, try and find this where the where it's more information to put to uh, put your bike and then you're done. Okay. Okay, so the difference is that while while that is an, um, an issue of use and situation impairment, you still can the user still can whip out their iPhone and take a lot longer time to actually um, you know, log in and find a location where they can put their bike. It's not, it's far more desperate for people with a disability. Um, this is a quote. Um, my, my computer system, for me, computer systems are everything. They're my hi fi, my source of income, my supermarket, my telephone, they're my way in. And this is take, taken from an, a quote taken from a, well, I don't know, mind it anonymous blind user. Okay? So for them, computers are critical. Okay? 
And if they're not, you, you know, you guys need to be thinking that some of the stuff that you design is about this critical usage. So even though you might not think it's critical, it is for people's life experience, or it can be. For instance, um, Tesco's, Tesco's created um, two different websites back in the day for, um, for uh, shopping. Okay? And the thing, that they, the thing about those shopping websites is that one was for digital disabled users, and it was much more simple, and fast to download, and one was for everybody else, and it was uh, very graphic intensive, okay, and slow to download. And what they found was that um, people went to the um, site they intended to be for the disabled users only because they wanted fast experience without any of the visual clutter. They didn't so that there wasn't, you know, the, the main website now is as good for visually disabled users uh, um, as, as anybody else. So, other people found this to be useful. Um, who, who's used an application called Reader? It's spelled with a little bit. Okay, no? So an application whereby um, you can simplify or you can remove all the junk off of, uh, off of something, a page that you want to read, and you just literally you But this this application is for everybody. But it comes from um, a group of uh, a group of applications um, that were built for disabled users. Okay? And the the um, the transcoding that occurs um, on Reader in allows well, it's called defluffing, so it takes away all the fluff, all the junk that you don't want, and just allows you to uh, read the actual text you say without and the slash Okay, and it's used by a lot of people. Okay, so here's some barriers to effectual use. Visual. Many, many challenges of providing efficient and effective experience or use. Okay. We'll come to um, efficient use next week, next week, which we'll be calling usability. So who's heard of usability? A few people have heard of usability. Okay, so usability is something that's more mainstream, if you like. Task completion times come under usability, that kind of thing. Okay. Menu sizes, that kind of stuff. How usable is the system? Um, cognitive. So cognitive disability, um, you, or people with learning disability, you may need to be able to um, display information of a lower grade language. Okay, so a different grade language. So you might even want to use your flash and Kent uh, models to understand whether the language is too complex that you're using. Um, also, it might be that it's better to translate um, text to images. So there's some, some systems whereby they're looking for concepts using natural language processing within, within some text, and then they take those concepts and try and create a visual collage. So these things, um, you need to take into account as well what kind of language you are you using. Can you, can you, instead of using imagery to just be something that's reasonably disposable, to actually assist people in, in an understanding? Um, hearing. So, you could also argue that hearing is an internationalisation issue. So, if you have internationalisation, which is about different kinds of language that can be used. Um, and... Um, with hearing, sign language, or say sign language is the first language of um, people with um, people with that. So, say English, written English isn't the first language of people, yeah. regardless of whether they're <coughs> it's British sign language. And in America, it's American sign language. That's the first language. So. Written, uh, red language, written languages, it might be um, as opposed to a visual language, isn't actually the, their first language. So therefore, how can you make your concepts and your terms translatable to the sign language? Yeah. Um, physical, many types of input solution, lots of people, well, not lots, but the, a significant number of people, in, in my opinion, uh, have locked-in syndrome, and that's increasing. Um, and so therefore, you know, how do we go about understanding brain interfaces and that kind of thing? And cognitive 
combinatorial. So <coughs> I use combinatorial. In, in the notes, you might use, you might, you might see my diatribe on combinatorial disability. Um, normally, this is called aging. Seniors, okay, as, being, as, a, as though being old is a disability, okay, which is absolute bollocks. Um, combinatorial disability just means that you're suffering from lots of different low-level um, uh, impairments in combination, and it's the combination that makes those impairments a problem. Now, because normally we can't, we, normally what we do is one one sentence might substitute a different one, okay, but when they're all slightly um, when you've got low level um, impairments uh, across co combinations of senses, then that can be more difficult to understand. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's about um, older users. Anybody can have combinatorial disability. Okay, so. See, this is exactly my point in question. You can't hear this. Thing. Okay, well, generally, you're going to see them, we'll just have to move on to see if this doesn't seem to be working. Um, the, the first one that you're going to see was, um, and I suggest when you actually look at this, you actually listen to it when you look at these uh, slides. The actual, the first part was, it was, it was talking about um, uh, a system called JAWS, or at least a system that's called screen reader, and that's visually disabled users and screen readers. And screen readers um, are useful for visually disabled users because they convert the text to speech. Um, now, the thing that you need to think about for screen readers and speech is that for visually disabled users, they, they don't listen to um, standard talking speed. So what you want to do is listen to um, how quickly the speech engine is set up for most uh, visually disabled users which is about, well, between 400 and 600 words a minute. Okay? So it sounds like a stream of noise, normally. And so you have to be practiced to understand it, but that's pretty much how it works. Now, we might speak at, what, 200 words a minute? I might. This might be 200 words a minute. Now. But for visually disabled users, it goes up significantly. Okay? Because the speech engine allows people to tailor the kind of speech to how they want it to be. Okay, so this one is, um, is an avatar that's auto-generated <coughs> sign language. It's American sign language, this one. Um, and so therefore, understanding, being able to have more simplified concepts or concepts that can be simplified within the terms that you're using 
means that it's easier to put one of these avatars automatically into your interfaces. Okay? So that therefore you could have an avatar that's doing the sign language translation um, as part of your interface. So here we go. Again. The problem with these avatars is that you'll see on there, when you're moving your fingers in this position, okay, that's counting, so you're obviously showing numbers. Yeah. Um, also, you'll see that uh, the avatar was spelling, okay, so finger spelling. Finger spelling is often not used, it's only used if you don't know the word or the sign for the word. And so this means that this avatar is going to be quite limited because they don't know the sign for some words. You also do that for spelling names, unless it was a common name. So if it's a common name, there's a sign for it. Or if, it's a, not, if it's not a common name, then you, you, you probably need to spell it. Okay. So with this, it's useful if you use common language, because those common languages more, have more of a chance of actually being included in the avatars um, uh, lexicon. Okay. So, other barriers that I think are actually there, which are, don't come under the normal, um, if you like, accessibility guidelines, and won't normally see, is I-18N. Let me know what that means. Yes? Internationalisation. Internationalisation. What's the 18 for? There's 18 letters missing between I and N. That's a very long word. Yeah, there's 18 letters, letters missing between the I and the N. So, accessibility is I-11Y, or Ali, because there's 11 letters. Um, okay, so uh, IHN, language and understanding. Um, so this is something that we that actually may be a disability, it's certainly a disability for me, but I get to situation with them if you like, and I get to a different country, not being able to speak any other language. Um, it'd be useful if there was some way I could translate that quickly. In fact, iPhone applications already exist, so you can point them at menus and they can translate from one language to another based on the uh, OCR article character recognition. Okay, there's also literacy, which I also think is wrong, is an issue. So literacy is something that can be changed, it's not immutable, but, um, but I think but a lot of people in the world today have low literacy levels. Okay? It's a problem for, for societies in general, but we also have to think about literacy when we're building software applications, because your applications have the um, ability to be transformative. So writing applications that are not just about work-related stuff, but are about other things, means that computational technology <coughs> in developing countries for people with low literacy have the ability to transform lives. Um, and we can see this by the massive use of mobile, mobile phones um, and mobile usage in Africa and in India, actually, where there's a number of systems which allow, um, which allow Owners of businesses, um, contractors, to interact with their mobile devices um, very cheap, low, low quality mobile devices, in a way that's similar to the web, but allows them to understand what information is being presented back. Sometimes simplifies that information and then vocalizes it, verbalizes it into one of the languages they can understand. Um, this means that they're far more able, they're, they're more able to get um, <coughs> contracts, business contracts. Okay, situational mobile, and other, so this is something that we can all think about. So, in general, situational impairment was originally created back in 2004 by uh, Andrew Sears, actually, uh, in the end of Baltimore. Um, and this is about, um, um, <coughs> it's about mobile usage. So, if you are hindered by 
um, I use a bit of mobile devices, so mobile uh, phones, mobile <coughs> devices which have low uh, screen real estate, low resolution, um, and also we're hindered when we're, um, say, on the screen on the bus, so using them when we've got jerky um, uh, environments, when we've got um, constrained environments of use. Okay, so that's what the situation is going to that. Um, developing regions and conventional use, so this is actually an excellent um, an excellent thing. So we, in developing regions, um, we, have as, we have people who are very innovative about their usage. So therefore, in a developing region, there's a lot that, the, if you like, developed regions can learn from um, developing regions just by the fact that the repurposing of um, items that might not intend to, be intended to be for technological use can be used in the technological context. And then device independence. So low income is about um, people who aren't able to afford general purpose computing uh, facilities um, and might only have a mobile phone or might only have an Xbox. Well, does that mean that they've got educational um, issues, that they aren't able to have the same kind, kind of educational opportunities or the same kind of opportunities for interaction with government that uh, people with general purpose technology so that's becoming less relevant now with regard to the need that you can use Xbox and these kind of situation systems um, for uh, education or certainly for um, web browsing, etc. But that's something that you need to also consider device independence. How can you get your um, applications onto as many devices as possible? And that's also useful for lots of other, um, uh, there's lots of other benefits in business for that because you obviously only want to create one instance of your code base and not have to worry about um, translating it to Android or uh, you know, Windows 8 or whatever it is. Okay. So here's one uh, technology that, uh, has anybody seen this technology? No? So this is one technology that's used in, um, uh, that's used in um, developing regions. Uh, first created in, uh, in uh, Zambia, if you can understand, uh, I think, uh, remember. But this is a Pringles tube used as a directional, highly directional Wi-Fi <coughs> antenna. Okay? And this highly directional Wi-Fi antenna costs the, costs the, um, the people there nothing to use, but it means that you can share one Wi-Fi, one Wi-Fi um, connection between a small village. So what, what they did was they, they had this Wi-Fi connection, they all wanted to use Wi-Fi because they all wanted to use the web because they all realised it was a really good thing to do for education, you know, for business. And so in the village, they just created a number of these directional uh, Wi-Fi receivers and pointed them all at the point source. And that way, you can easily, you know, well, these, this is a transmitter actually, um, but you can point this transmitter at the receiver as well. But you get this transmitter, and it means that you've got a very directional screen. So it means that you can you can extend the range of your Wi-Fi over a small village. Okay. Because it's that necessary. Um, this kind of thing is actually a loop. So, for instance, device independence is a really important aspect of uh, developing regions of low income. Um, mobile browsing, mobile browsing. When desktop browsing in um, developed regions was the primary thing, was the primary way that people um, interacted with the web. In developing regions, and in fact the majority of the web, it was all mobile. Okay, so because there was just more mobile phones the world over. Okay. It's changing now. Um, Barclays had this idea of this mobile cash transfer. So Barclays had this idea for mobile trash tra uh, cash transfer in the UK, but it wasn't Barclays' idea. They ripped it off from um, Africa, okay? some, some various countries in Africa. The, the mobile to mobile cash transfer was seen as a way of actually allowing people to make payments that were secure, and the only way that they could do that was by mobile phone, because there was no cards or anything or ATMs and that kind of stuff. So this mobile mobile step technology was created not in the developed regions, as you might imagine, or as Barclays would like to think, but it was developed in Africa. Same with the Pringles Wi-Fi. Um, mobile phone torch, it's kind of a disposable one, but what happened is that Nokia sent a number of ethnographers, anthropologists who were writing ethnographies, to, um, to India and Africa 
And they realized that because there was no light in, in these places, no energy source, or very little, much smaller 